Well, hello everyone. I'm Jonathan Tepperman. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy. Welcome to our latest weekly FP Insider Conference Call, where we bring together top thinkers and doers for discussions of some of the world's most pressing issues. Today, we're going to be talking about global supply chains and how the pandemic has affected this crucial aspect of the global economy, one that was already under serious threat before any of us had even heard this word, coronavirus. Uh, before we get started, I need to spend a few short seconds explaining how this call is going to work. As soon as I finish the introduction, I'll introduce our two guests. The three of us will have a brief conversation, and then I'll bring in questions from all of you in our audience. Now, how you pose a question depends on how you're connecting with us. Um, for those of us who joined us via Zoom, just hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question in the box that pops up there. If you've called us by phone, please email your questions to web at foreignpolicy.com. And in either case, uh, when you ask a question, please be sure to tell us your first name, your organization, and your location, so know who we're hearing from. Um, and you can ask those questions at any time. Start sending them in now if you're, if you're eager. Okay, so enough uh, housekeeping. It's now my great pleasure to introduce two of the truly smartest and sharpest analysts I know. Elizabeth Bra runs the Modern Deterrence Project at London's Royal United Services Institute, RUSI. And much more important, uh, as I'm sure she'll tell you, she's also an FP columnist. And Shannon O'Neill is Deputy Director of Studies, Vice President, and Senior Fellow for Latin America, all at the Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome to both of you. Please uh, turn on your cameras and unmute your, uh, your audio. There you are. Just wait for Elizabeth. There you are. Hi, it's great to see you both. Of course, it's uh, great to see anybody these days, but I really mean it in, in your case. Um, Shannon, let me start with you. Uh, so I know it's gonna be hard somewhat to generalize because uh, this is a huge topic, but I'd love it if you could sort of set the scene for us and tell us what is the state of global supply chains at the moment? You know, as, as everyone on this call will know, and I alluded to a second ago, we were already going through this process of rising protectionism and economic nationalism before the pandemic hit. A month ago, you wrote, uh, and I quote, if the virus and the economic wreckage it is causing aren't contained soon, Blueberries and avocados won't be the only things missing from market shelves across the still chilly Midwest and Northeast United States. Cars, clothes, electronics, and basic medicines will run short as far off factories disconnect. We're not there yet, I think, although it is still chilly in the, the Northeast, um, but what are you seeing? Are your predictions coming true? So I think some of those are on the way and we're starting to see it filter through these supply chains that go across countries. And right now there are um, different types of tensions or stresses on supply chains. So one of them that we're seeing from the pandemic is just the direct effect of the disease. So we've seen you know, pork processing plants in the Midwest shut down because workers are getting sick and so they can no longer work in there. So that is a kind of threat to these supply chains, actual factories not able to work because, because workers are sick. Uh, and that I think we're seeing across all kinds of countries. It's happening in Mexico, it's happening in other places. That's one stress. Another stress that's starting to work its way through and will end up hitting consumers is um, the sort of uneven logistics. So there are boats off the port of Los Angeles that are filled with goods that have not yet been unloaded uh, and that means they can't go back yet to China and pick up things from the factories that have been reopening over the last several months. So we have sort of a disconnect in where, where the ships are. We also have an airline industry that's pretty much not flying and actually 50% of the cargo capacity in the world that moves stuff around is in the bottom of passenger planes, not freight planes. So we're having some challenges on the logistics side. Um, something that hasn't quite hit yet, but that we're gonna start seeing in the next few months is sort of the uneven opening of factories. So when Wuhan shut down in China, all of a sudden there were, you know, plastic brackets and other little pieces that were made just there that the rest of the world whose factories were still open couldn't get. 
Now Wuhan is back open, but some of those factories around the world are shut down. So that plastic bracket maker doesn't have a client to sell to. So that unevenness of who's open and who's not is affecting production. And we'll see down the road if and when demand picks up, it just might not be there. And then starting with what you laid out at the beginning, governments are starting to react, right? And we're seeing at least in some countries, this protectionist push. So, you know, before the pandemic hit, we had a few protectionist measures in terms of medical supplies or food. And now the WTO, there's over hundred that have been put in place in just the last couple of months. And those kinds of things are affecting what can move across borders, um, also affecting these supply chains. So there's a lot of different factors that coming together, I do worry about what's gonna end up on our consumer shelves. Elizabeth, um, I wanna bring you in, what do you see and uh, is there anything that's happened that was particularly surprising to you? Well, I think for those of us who uh, enjoy the quite depressing activity of, of watching supply chains, all of this has not been surprising at all because supply chains are incredibly vulnerable. And I must say, it's almost a miracle that until now they have worked so seamlessly. But what we have noticed is, as Sharon, Shannon just described, is that they are being disrupted in, in, in various little uh, instances and if if one piece of, of that of the supply chain doesn't work then the supply chain itself doesn't work clearly and I think what's really interesting now what we should be watching is how long inventories will last because once uh, companies' inventories um, have run out, then that's when we start seeing those shortages that, that Shannon just described. And so I was looking, for example, at the study uh, by McKinsey that just came out, and they're predicting that automotive inventories will run out uh, this month. Uh, well, this is an, 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 a global average. Uh, consumer products in June uh, retail in July and and so forth. The only ones that will re that are in somewhat better shape are pharma pharmaceuticals and semiconductors, and it's, it's clear why because it, those uh, components are pretty small, so you don't need a lot of inventory space. So I think we will be seeing shortages on on our um, on our shop shelves very soon or relatively soon. And uh, another aspect I think we should be watching, which I've been worrying about, is um, stockpiling by retailers. So retailers are watching this and saying, well, <laughs> I better stock up for my for my uh, customers. And so we'll be seeing the behavior that, that ordinary people engaged in a couple of months ago when the lockdown was announced and everybody went to stock up on, on uh, what they thought were necessary products. Now, as we were mentioning a minute ago, um, the signs from and involving China have been mixed. Uh, on the one hand, China has largely opened up its manufacturing uh, base again. Um, and we have this new trade deal uh, or the reiteration of a deal that's not actually a trade deal, but it's a promise to do a few vague things um, that seemed unrealistic when the deal was struck and even, unmore, even more realistic, unrealistic now. Um, on the other hand, um, there is a uh, Tensions between the two countries, um, rhetoric between Washington and Beijing is continuing to get worse. So how are the politics uh, affecting the actual movement of goods at the moment? At, why don't you start, Elizabeth? The, so the politics is, is the tricky part. I think we are all quite annoyed with China or enraged, but the, the fact is that we, we, we depend on their products. And I think what will happen, so I, well, first of all, what's what's being presented as the alternative is some sort of return to nationalism where everything is produced in our countries. That won't happen. And the reason it won't happen is that we consumers not willing to pay for that for that to happen, because if, if that were to be the solution, then products would be uh, much more expensive than they are today. Uh, and we, the global middle class, are used to low consumer product prices. But I think what will happen is that countries are and companies and business leaders, countries and business leaders are, are uh, realizing that China is maybe not the benevolent actor that we, we all, well, that many of us were assuming it was. And so they will think of alternatives, which means going from single source to multiple source. And I think governments will encourage companies to do that. I, and I a question in my mind is whether they will even incentivize them to do that so that we are not so exposed to whatever disruption um, may, may uh, be caused by Chinese companies or the Chinese government. 
Shannon, let me ask you to pick up on this last thing that um, Elizabeth said, um, which is how things are looking in the rest of the world that has a very different relationship with China than the United States does. Are other countries like Japan also pulling out um, and bringing uh, uh, facilities home or are countries trying to take advantage of the reduction in trade between the US and China to get more uh, China business for themselves or is it some combination of the two or some third thing that I couldn't think of? <laughs> so it's interesting here with China. So we have seen other countries try to use this leverage, the, the challenges China is facing to bring companies home. So Japan specifically is offering incentives and a lot of money, billions of dollars to try to bring factories and others home. Other Asian uh, nations are trying to do the same because you know we talk a lot about the US-China competition in terms of manufacturing and the like, but Asia as much if not more faces competition from Chinese producers. Um, so you know they're also you know, competing with them and also they're trying many, Korean companies, Taiwanese companies are trying to protect their intellectual property rights in semiconductors and other things. They have as many challenges as we do. So while we may be more vocal in the United States uh, in terms of, of China, it's, it, we're not the alone in these things. One of the challenges for 2020 is when you look at IMF estimates and others, one of the biggest places of growth this next year in 2020 is gonna be China, right? Yes, they shut down first, but they're reopening first and they have sort of a, a base um, of growth. So as you look at Latin America, the Middle East, other emerging markets, if you're looking for a market to sell into this year and you're desperate to sell your goods, China is going to be the place. Um, and so it's hard to decouple or pull back or find other alternatives for your commodities or your other goods. That is really the market this year. And I think the U.S. is going to have some of that challenge as well, um, because that is, that's who's gonna be consuming in this year ahead. And so how do you keep to, you know, protecting intellectual property rights, trying to get China to be a good player in the system, perhaps by pulling back, when that's really for individual company decisions, that's the place where you're gonna find customers. Sure, sure. Um, Elizabeth, this question is for you because uh, you look at in your work, the overlap between supply chains and security. So I'm curious um, what you see as the security implications, the national security implications of the collapse or the fraying of supply chains. Has it affected US or other countries national security already or is that likely to come? Well, you might say it has affected national security already because if uh, China had decided not to export the medical supplies that our countries all needed or are now still needing to, to combat the coronavirus outbreaks in our respective countries, then it, we would have truly been in, a, in a, a horrible position. Now, fortunately, China decided to export, which is it's in their interest. They want to sell goods, but um, uh, it, it highlights our dependence on China, for not just for, for what we thought were vital goods, but for seemingly totally unsexy products like uh, medical supplies. And that's something that I think uh, has uh, enormous implications. So the US, for example, has something called CFIUS, a regulatory body that examines um, commercial uh, transactions, takeovers of US companies. Uh, and uh, and in, in other countries, there are similar arrangements, even though they are not as good. But typically, those uh, regulatory bodies only look at strategic, uh, traditionally strategic sectors, such as defense. Well, I think what this uh, situation is showing that is that a, a many more sectors are strategic to, to a country um, simply because we would not be able to, to operate and to keep functioning uh, without those goods. So medical supplies and components for, for um, things like uh, ventilators, who knew that that was a, tr a strategic, uh, strategic good without which we would uh, be in terrible shape. Turning um, uh, to a slightly different topic, if the Trump administration gets its way, it and Beijing continue to escalate um, the conflict and the United States starts to achieve something that looks like decoupling. What is it going to look like for the impact going to look like for the world economy and what will it mean for the US economy? 
can the United States have any plausible chance of recovering from this very deep recession? Um, the trade, the, the, the job numbers that came out today um, are the worst since the Great Depression. Um, is there any way we can get out of that without restoring trade ties uh, with China? Uh, or could this shortening uh, or relocation of supply chains actually be a good thing for the United States, leading to more security, more stability, maybe more jobs at home? So, Elizabeth, you already alluded to this uh, earlier, so you want to pick it up? Yes. Um, I, I think a relocation of parts of the supply chain would be a very good thing. Maybe not all to, to, to the domestic uh, base of whichever the company uh, is, but at least closer to home. Uh, the, the challenge is that that will make uh, uh, products, a whole or the end product, a whole lot more expensive simply because we wouldn't be able to use the, the cheap labor in those countries. And, and here's the paradox. It's cheaper to make, for example, shoes in Cambodia or China and ship them all the way to, to the US or Europe. Um, even including the shipping costs, uh, that's cheaper than, than manufacturing them at home. And so I think what we need is, is a little bit of public education about uh, the cost of globalization and, and what goes into the price you pay for a pair of shoes or even a, a cheap toy. And, and maybe what, what the real price would be if we paid people properly and, and if, if these products were made closer to home, which, uh, I think most people have decided it's probably would probably be a good idea in many cases. So uh, we I think we have to get out, snap out of this illusion. We, the global middle class, that that uh, we can live uh, very conveniently with cheap goods and and uh, and in, in perfect convenience. The convenience trap uh, is 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 a trap and. Uh, Either we get used to paying more or we get used to uh, regular uh, disruptions to the supply chains. Um, Shannon, you, you work on uh, Latin America. So um, let me bring in two related uh, uh, que listener questions. The first is from Peter Glass, who works for Devante Warehouse Management Systems in the Netherlands. And he wonders whether um, in order to restore and uh, stabilize um, uh, supply chains, uh, companies could move uh, more facilities, production facilities, places like Eastern Europe, which are relatively low cost compared to the rest of Europe. Um, Jasjeet Singh from the US Chamber of Commerce asked essentially the same question about India, whether it could be a beneficiary of the shift. And then of course there are countries like Mexico, could they also benefit? You know, I think before the pandemic, what was interesting is supply chains were starting to move around. China, yes, had been the center of them for, for a few decades, but you were starting to see a shift. And there were there are lots of reasons for this. One is uh, Chinese wage rates were going up, so they weren't always the lowest cost producer um, and often not the lowest cost producer. But you also have other technological changes, automation, robots coming in, 3D printing. Things were already starting to, to shake up before you had this, this shock, this external shock. And so companies were looking for other places. I mean, one other interesting fact here is actually China for several years in the last decade has been a net F foreign direct investment exporter, not importer. So Chinese companies were actually looking for other markets to put their factories, uh, looking for lower costs in throughout Southeast Asia, Africa, and other places. So all of that, I think, is just a context for, could you see people moving to India? Could you see them moving to Eastern Europe or Mexico? Definitely, right? If you have a mix of benefits that are you know, the right kind of labor, it's not always the cheapest, but you have the right kind of labor for the kind of factory you're setting up, which may be more automated than those in the past. Uh, you have the right logistics. Um, you know, when I talk to heads of companies or managers and in companies, increasingly logistics costs cost more than labor costs. So that is what they're trying to optimize more than can you get a cheaper worker? You know, a few cents off of that side is not worth it if the logistics costs in terms of time or money are, are that much higher. So I think there's a lot of, as we come out of this pandemic, whenever that happens to be, I do think we will start seeing this movement that had been happening before in the last decade. I think we will see an acceleration as companies try to rethink, is it better to be closer? Is it better to be domestic? Is it better to be regional? Uh, and so other countries that have maybe 
like-minded governments, languages, foreign trade agreements and the like, those might be more important than say a huge mass production factory that had been on the other side of the world. So I think we're gonna see a lot of volatility and movement in the decade to come. Um, and what about the US picture? And this uh, relates to another question we just got from Rajendra Shirola, who's a professor of strategy and international business at Hult International Business School. I mean, can the US recover um, without just going back to the things that uh, like they were before? Uh, is the US economy so dependent on China still that any kind of a near term recovery will require restoring the old trade, uh, the rate, old trade routes because creating new ones will take so much time and there are so many obstacles to uh, restoring manufacturing in the US. Uh, I'll, I'll jump That's in and then Elizabeth. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, you know, the short term ability to cut off China, I think is, is hurting ourselves. That I, I don't see it being possible if you wanna have goods at reasonable prices on our shelves. Um, but the sort of medium to longer term shifting that's happening around the world will continue to happen. One of the challenges for the United States is that it is not just one country, it's not just China, it is an Asian ecosystem, it's an industrial ecosystem that draws from all these different countries. And so if you read these sort of classic studies of the iPhone, yes, the intellectual property happens in Cupertino, California, uh, China assembles it, but the really expensive specialty parts come from Japan and Korea and Taiwan and some are in Middle Asia, they come from all of, over Asia and then are put together with some, some value added in China increasingly, but still a pretty small amount. And so it's not just, can we pull out of China? We, can we pull out of all of Asia? And I think for a product like that, the answer is definitely not yeah. right now. The other challenge- I mean, given, given the extent to which um, con, uh, uh, contractors often use subcontractors to supply them with things, do companies even know where all of their parts are coming from? Because the subcomponents for the components may be uh, wildly uh, uh, spread out. Yeah, it's sort of suppliers over suppliers over suppliers. It's like that old adage, it's, it's turtles all the way down, right? You don't know exactly where things are coming from. That is something I actually think we could see when you fast forward after the pandemic, we could see either companies themselves but also governments asking for demanding more transparency in those supply chains, really knowing not just who you're contracting with, but then three or four layers down where things are coming from. Um, and, and I think that is a smart way of dealing with this in terms of the vulnerabilities that we've seen that may not add a huge amount of cost for companies who can't, who can't bear an increase of cost. Mm -hmm. If I can come in on that. I, so um, for a foreign policy piece, I think a couple of years ago, um, I did a thought experiment, or actually not a thought experiment, a real experiment, looking at how many companies are involved in, in the average automaker supply chain. And so if we calculate that the average automaker has around 5,000 suppliers, and each of those suppliers has around 250 uh, subcontractors, that's in just the tier one and tier two uh, chains or, or, or uh, tier one and tier two uh, supply chain of that company. It's more than one million companies that are involved, and that's it's it's impossible for the for the end customer, so the, the top in that supply chain, to to have a good understanding of who is in that supply chain. And and here is the risky part: you'll only find out as the end customer. So let's say uh, Ford or, or General Motors or or whatever the, the uh, the end customers, you'll only find out <clears throat> what the vulnerability in your supply chain is when one of those companies fails you. And unfortunately, the, the, the picture is similar for ministries of, ministries of defense. They don't have a good understanding of all the companies that are involved in, in their defense contractors' supply chains. And so it, it is a, a risky um, situation we're in but that is the nature of, of globalized supply chains. Gary Walker asks, you talked about possible disruptions of consumer goods, especially foodstuffs in the US. How is this going to affect developing countries, especially small island states that depend on imports even more than the United States does? I think it's a huge challenge, right? We're right now being in the United States, we're focused on the United States, but um, all sorts of countries are gonna face this and many are more dependent than we are. 
the other issue is of these, I mentioned over 100 sort of new protectionist measures that the WTO is, has registered in the last couple of months. Um, many of those are food issues, right? So mm -hmm. governments that produce wheat and rice and the like, or countries that produce those things are not allowing them to be exported. So that brings even greater pressure on islands, on other nations that are big importers of food stuff. So I think this is a real challenge. Uh, one interesting twist on this US-China phase one deal that seems to be going ahead is by encouraging slash forcing the Chinese to buy more US goods, what are they going to buy? Well, one of the things that they would like to buy is more pork and meat from the United States. And the US supply chains in pork and meat right now are under stress because of what's yeah. happening in the processing plant. So the uh, ironic or perhaps counterproductive aspect may be that there'll be more shortages of pork and meat in the United States because of this trade deal and, and the Chinese trying to meet their obligations. Interesting. That'll be a hard one to explain come November. Yes. <laughs> um, Peter, who works in educational development in Virginia Beach, um, wants to pick up on something, Elizabeth, you said about education and ask, what kind of educational component is there to all of this? And whether we can use education to better prepare consumers for what's to come. For example, he doesn't say this, but I, I wonder if the implication of what you were saying is that um, we may need to somehow train Americans to uh, expect to pay more for the uh, flood of cheap consumer goods um, that has done had a remarkable impact on US living standards over the last 20 years. I mean, one of the this is so if a fascinating subject to me because one of the least understood um, uh, aspects of the debate on inequality and on income in the last 20 years is that while incomes have not risen, A, there's been very little inflation and B, consumer goods have gotten so cheap that even um, uh, Americans who are not paid very well and have precarious job situations can afford certain luxuries that even their parents, let alone their grandparents, could never have dreamed of. Uh, are we going to, are, are people going to accept paying more for that? Is there any way to convince them to? Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you uh, to the listener for that excellent question. So, uh, I, well, I think because we're used to these goods, if they were to become more expensive, I think we would um, we would uh, get annoyed and we would buy them anyway. But somebody has to be honest with us about the fact that that uh, the prices are artificially low and they are artificially low because we rely on, on cheap labor uh, in other countries and including on our uh, high seas because we should remember that all 80% of the world's trade travels by sea and the people um, transporting our goods on those seas are, are um, not particularly well paid. Um, so I think uh, in answer to, to the question, I think uh, it's easy to say all oh, the politicians should say this or that, but actually now uh, with an election season coming up, it would be um, we're already underway. It would be a good idea to be honest with, with uh, the public about uh, how exposed we are to, disrupt, to, to the potential of disrupted supply chains and uh, to highlight the fact that if we want to be safer, we might want to pay more to have the goods made at home. Now, I realize that's a difficult argument to make uh, to a public that's used to paying $200 for a laptop, where in, in even just 10 or 20 years ago, they had to pay several times that. But um, I, I think people are more uh, grown up, the public is more grown up than decision makers. Uh, like to think or they assume they are. And here's an example. Um, the Swedish government, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency two years ago put out a leaflet called If Crisis or War Comes. And it described what to do uh, in case of a crisis or war. So an attack by mother nature or an attack by a, hostile, by a hostile state. And you know what sort of goods you need to have at home, what you need to do if power goes out for an extended period of time, if the internet goes down, if there's no water. And I proposed to the British government that it would be a good idea for the UK government to do the same because there would be a crisis of some sort and they say oh no, no that would be terrible because people would be frightened well lo and behold here we are with a crisis that that um, disrupted people's lives and uh, of course people responded 
by panicking. And so uh, there will be panic at some point. I would propose it's better to have the panic before the crisis hits. So long answer to, to I think it was Peter in Virginia Beach, um, a, a public conversation, uh, not just involving politicians, but business leaders as well. Um. Nitin Arya, who's a PhD candidate in Germany at the University of Rostock, wonders whether we could or should see the emergence of any kind of a, a new sort of international organization, whether on the NATO model or what have you, that focuses not just on um, geopolitical hard security, but on the kind of um, uh, food and economic security that has been implicated and threatened by this crisis. You see, uh, you know, th th there's been a lot of talk about using this uh, opportunity to reform the WTO and fix measures there. Do you see this becoming, um, this crisis getting used in the classic sense to fix big changes in the international trade regime, um, whether it's with existing organizations or the creation of new ones? I can start, you can start on, on. Well, yeah. Uh, so thank you for that question. So I, I think if, this crisis has shown anything. It is that international organizations have too little power, and it's um, it's uh, uh, breaks the tears. Will hate me for saying this, but what it has shown, for example, is that the European Commission should have uh, much more power, so that it would be able to to react and act quickly in a crisis rather than having to wait for all the member states. So, uh, and it, actually, a similar situation uh, is true for the WHO where um, the leadership and the staff of the WHO are largely dependent on, on member states um, letting them do what, what they think it needs to be done. So I, I think what needs to happen is, is for the, the European Commission to get more executive power, for the WHO leadership to get more executive power and then almost a report back to, to the board afterwards, as it were, in a sort of CEO style capacity. Uh, I don't think we need more international organizations uh, because it, it, there is uh, a, a great deal of competition already. But if we got the, the ones we have to, to if we gave them more power, I think we would be in, in good shape. And actually, what's interesting to, to see since uh, the listener mentioned NATO is that NATO has actually stepped up it, within, uh, within uh, the limitations of a military alliance to at least uh, help uh, coordinate and even transport medical supplies between its member states and, and partner nations. Shannon, we have a question for you from the office of Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. He asks two-parter, given the complexities with supply chain vulnerabilities, how does the growing dependence on online marketplaces play in a role in this, particularly regarding transparency? And then turning to Latin America, what countries apart from Brazil and Mexico could take on supply chains and manufacturing from China? Um, so the first one, I think he's asking sort of the role of e-commerce and, and the like. And right. I mean, one, one thing e-commerce or some of these other platforms have done is allow different suppliers and customers to connect in ways that they hadn't before. So it's much, it's easier at least to find people on the other side of the world that can sell you things or you can buy things from. So it's made it in some ways easier to have more global supply chains, to lengthen them rather than shorten them. Now it doesn't always work and there still is an element of trusting and verifying and, and credibility and the like, but, but it has provided sort of an ability to look much further than one could have in the past. Whether that holds or not, um, we'll see when we come out of this on the other side, but, but that is I think the basis of those platforms, what it's been able to do um, is make the world more global than it, than it had been before. Uh, in terms of looking to the Western Hemisphere and who could make things, if you saw sort of a reshoring um, to, to this side of the Pacific, um, Mexico is obviously a place where we've seen a lot of this in the past and I think it continues to be so. Um, we have seen in some Central American countries, um, particularly textiles, making of socks and clothes and things like that, there is already a base there and perhaps that could be something that, that would expand as we go forward. Um, you know, all of the countries in South America have some kind of industrial capacity and could potentially be partners or places for various types of manufacturing. One of the challenges here is the nature of government. So one thing is to have, you know, land and natural resources and production capability and workforces that can do these kinds of things. 
The other is to have governments that have policies in place that make it easy to work there if you're a US multinational or if you want to export to other countries. So several Latin American countries, we have free trade agreements with the United States. So Peru and Colombia and Chile, Central America and Mexico. Other countries, we don't have those agreements. So Brazil, Argentina, other places. Um, so as we think through where you might move things, if you're going to bring it back to the side, sort of the policy matters as well as the size of the workforce that you would need for your factory. And also as companies look at this, they look at the consumer markets of these countries where not only can they sell things to the United States, but do they see a growing middle class or a consumption base there? So I think all of those uh, matter as you think about moving your factories around. And some places are candidates in the Western hemisphere and some I think it will take a bit longer to, to be a location. So what do you see as the key lessons for companies specifically in this crisis, both in terms of how to respond um, and what to do after to prevent the kind of damage they've suffered this time? Um, are there many options for companies on their own or, or, or are we all completely beholden to the decisions of our governments and to nature? I would say there are some companies when 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 boards are making decisions, managers and executives are making decisions, they do think about the vulnerabilities um, and things like this are on their on their agenda. If will their supply chain break down? Will the inventories get there in time for production to grow? Um, but they're also thinking about the bottom line and putting in more slack or putting in larger inventories. It it costs money, and especially if you're a publicly listed company that has been a challenge, right? Your shareholders want to see the bottom line every quarter and they want to see the best margins they can get. And so that often- So was the move to, sorry to interrupt, was the move to just in time um, a mistake in retrospect? So just in time, I mean, it started back in the 1970s and 80s and has been honed and become the mantra. Um, it is a mistake if you see it in this pandemic and the, and the fragility of supply chains, but it was also one of the reasons um, that we have laptops that cost $200, that we have, you know, flat screen TVs that have, you know, are now a tenth in the price and much more clear and bigger than they've ever been. So there is great prosperity and luxuries that have become everyday things precisely because of just-in-time delivery. So I think now we need to find this balance. How do you keep some of the benefits of quote-unquote lean manufacturing um, but make it so that things don't fall apart if there is a big disruption. If I can come in on that, Jonathan, I think when Just In Time uh, was, when it uh, boomed and, and grew, it was when the world was completely peaceful and uh, countries were, were on good terms with one another and uh, we didn't yet see uh, massive effects uh, from climate change, but all of that is already changing, right? Um, so we are, uh, there is more uh, competition between countries, uh, uh, hostile competition, I would say, so gray zone activity where countries, hostile countries can use or and may use and are already using um, uh, quite nasty means to weaken other countries and, and uh, one way of weakening another country without that country being able to resort to, to uh, uh, a military response is to, to harm that country's uh, companies. And so, um, the, the situation in which companies operate is no longer as uh, harmonious as it was when just in time uh, expanded. And then uh, climate change, of course, is contrib contributing to that situation where, uh, well, this time it was a virus, but next time it may be um, uh, an extreme weather event. And if I think we all remember the 2011 Fukushima incident where an extreme weather event in, this, in that case a tsunami uh, caused a, a nuclear accident and, and the supply chain from the Fukushima region was broken which affected car makers all over the world because they depended on those fantastic uh, suppliers in the Fukushima region and they used single source and then and, and it worked perfectly with that just in time model and then all of a sudden <laughs> they couldn't uh, make their cars anymore. So what then do you think are the key lessons and takeaways for governments? Um, again, both what are the recommendations for getting through this period and then the recommendations for how to change things once we have? 
Yeah, well, I can start on that. I think the the, uh, the key lesson should be that the market won't sort itself uh, in ev in any in every instance. Most of the time, it's it's fine and and an invisible hand works well. But uh, there is a, such a close connection now between the market and national security and and the well being of of any given country that that. Uh, I think governments have to be uh, willing to to um, participate a bit more in helping uh, maintain a stable uh, situation on markets. And and for example, uh, if we look at the case of, of China and how it may um, how Chinese supply chains may be affected or may affect other countries. So there's a case of. Uh, Gui Minhao, Minhai, I hope I pronounced that correctly, I always get it wrong, but a Hong Kong bookseller who acquired Swedish citizenship 20 years ago, um, and then went back to, well, went, went to Hong Kong and became a bookseller and is now in jail in China. And Sweden has protested against uh, his incarceration, but get, is getting nowhere. And at the same time, Swedish companies are heavily dependent on Chinese supply chains or Chinese suppliers. I think there is a concern, should be a concern for Swedish companies and that's the Swedish government that China in order to punish Sweden for, for keeping uh, Gui Minhai on, on the political radar that it will punish Swedish companies uh, by slowing down their supplies from China. And so that's not something where China could be punished by the US, but it's a case where one particular country will suffer, would suffer greatly. And so it, it all hangs together. And that's where I think governments will inevitably realize that they have to be, they have to play a stronger role on market than they have in the past 20 years. Jenny, what do you have to Jump in. Um, you know, I think it shows that there is this role for government and particularly in strategic sectors, right? We have strategic petroleum reserves and we have other things that we've re we believe are important to national security. And now, um, as we look at this, there's there's other areas we should include, right? Medical equipment is one that, that should be beefed up probably. And the, the US government or other governments around the world should be playing a role there. Um, we've also seen that companies will go for that bottom line. That is their incentive. So how, so there is a role for government. There's a public good in having more resilience, having more slack in these systems. Um, and so I think the next debate is how do you do that uh, in ways that aren't distorting, right? That don't lead to cronyism or don't lead to other challenges. Do you, how do you encourage uh, companies to, to include those elements? So I think that is sort of the next um, issue. And, and I think there are different tools, you know, carrots that governments can put out there, whether it is sort of buying capacity for particular strategic industries or stockpiles or, or the like. Um, but I think one thing as we go forward, supply chains have brought amazing prosperity and benefits to people in mature economies, people in developing economies, and it would be it would be everyone's loss, I think, to have a huge pullback, right? You look at countries that don't trade with the rest of the world. You look at those that are more closed and they are you know, almost without exception, poorer, less innovative, uh, worse health statistics and all of the like, and, and, and less open in terms of government. So I would hate that the lesson we would take from this pandemic is to bring everything back because some of the other good things that have happened with opening and trading and working with the rest of the world could be lost in that. Well, from your lips to God's ears, as my grandmother used to say. I hate to do this, but we are out of time. So I need to say, want to say thank you to everyone who joined us. And thanks so much, especially to, to Shannon and Elizabeth for this fascinating conversation. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly on foreignpolicy.com slash live. Please don't forget that FP Insider subscriptions include more of these conference calls and a whole range of other um, really useful benefits. Next week's call will be on the pandemic's effect on emerging markets. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks again so much. Take care.